Hello, my friends. July 4th, 2017. I remember 4th of July when I was a little kid. At 4525 Harlan Street, Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Across that street was Lakeside Park. And they would shoot off fireworks on 3rd of July in the evening. And the cars would take about half or three quarters of an hour getting out of there. The traffic was just blocked up once it was over. We had a front row seat. And I loved 4th of July. I loved the fireworks. I loved the ones that went when they get up there and they branch off, you know, like neon tubes, sort of. Happy days. Not like today. Today is a sorrowful day. This is Independence Day. When we declared our independence from Britain in Philadelphia, 1776, I've got on my printer here yeah. I tore it. The back is uh, the start. Not quite the start, but we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I can't see because it it's backwards. You know what it says. We also hold that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new governments, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. This is the part that shows, ordinarily, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design, evinces a design. There is the perception on the part of the patriot of something that is not published, but is, is noticeable and recognizable, a design on the part of those who have the power, a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. Now, talking about a design, that this guy would be called a conspiracy theorist at this point. Oh, you see all kinds of, of, of uh, secret designs, do you? When a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, that's a judgment. That doesn't have a label on it says this is we are pursuing a, a, an object they don't say that evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism it is their right it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security i have to reprint this
in, um, I think it was 1824, then Secretary of State, future President, John Quincy Adams, gave a wonderful speech in which he praised his country. He, he admired his country so much. She is the, the well-wisher of all democracies and all peoples in the world and wishes them all freedom. And at one point he made his famous quote, she does not go abroad seeking uh, monsters to destroy, but she is the well-wisher of all and the supporter of all in their effort to gain their own freedom and their own independence. That was the America that we were taught about, that we were told that's who we are. All the while, and I, mean, I grew up in the 50s, when the Dulles brothers were overthrowing countries, overthrowing countries, overthrowing countries. These guys here. Right? And these. That has not changed. I don't know if you could say it's gotten worse, but it's pretty bad right now. We're we're threatening war with Russia. Uh, most of you probably know who General Wesley Clark is. But for those of you who don't, he was the supreme commander of NATO in the days of Bill Clinton. And he sub subsequently uh, entered a, the race for uh, president. Not uh, terribly successful, but... <clears throat> For a military man, I found him very admirable. I'm going to play a little clip here for you. When he talks about the United States underwent a coup d'etat. As he says, a policy coup. For a TV, the world is thinking. What happened in 9-11 is we didn't have a strategy, we didn't have bipartisan agreement, we didn't have American understanding of it, and we had instead a policy coup in this country, a coup, a policy coup. Some hard-nosed people took over the direction of American policy, and they never bothered to inform the rest of us. I went through the Pentagon 10 days after 9-11. I couldn't stay away from Mother Army. I went back there to see Don Rumsfeld. I'd worked for him as a White House fellow in the 1970s. All this is in the book. And, um, and I said, am I doing okay on CNN? And he said, yeah, 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 fine. He said, uh, I'm thinking about it. He says, I read your book. And uh, he said, uh, this is a book that talks about the Kosovo campaign. And he said, I just want to tell you, he said, nobody's going to tell us where or when we can bomb. Nobody. He said, I'm thinking of calling this a floating coalition. What do you think about that? I said, well, sir, uh, thanks for reading my book. And, uh, well, uh, he said, thanks. That's all the time I've got. <laughs> really? And um, I went downstairs. I was leaving the Pentagon, and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, I, I want you to know, he said, sir, we're going to attack Iraq. And I said, why? He said, we don't know. He said, uh, I said, well, did they tie Saddam to 9-11? He said, uh, no. He said, but um, I guess it's they don't know what to do about terrorism. And so uh, the it, they think but they can attack states and they want to look strong. And so I guess they think if they take down a state, it will intimidate the terrorists. And, you know, it's like that old saying, he said, if the only two you have is a hammer, then every problem has to be a nail. Well, 
I walked out of there pretty upset. And then um, we attacked Afghanistan. I was pretty happy about that. We should have. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office. It says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. And I, I, I sat on this information I, for a long time, for about six or eight months. I, I was so stunned by this, I couldn't begin to talk about it. And I couldn't believe it would really be true, but that's actually what happened. Uh, these people took control of the policy in the United States. And I realized then it came back to me, a 1991 meeting I had with Paul Wolfowitz. You know, in 2001, he was Deputy Secretary of Defense, but in 1991, he was the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. It's the number three position in the Pentagon. And I had gone to see him when I was a one-star general. I was commanding the National Training Center. I had met him one time. He said, if you ever get to Washington, come look me up. They always say that. Well, I was there in Washington. It was a Friday afternoon. I'd visited Colin Powell. He'd given me five minutes of his precious time and sent me on my way, and I was bored in the Pentagon. And, and I thought, I'll just go, who can I see? I'll, I think I'll see Wolfowitz. So I called and up there. He was available. Scooter Libby came to the door. I met Scooter for the first time, and he brought me in. And uh, I said to Paul, I said, and this is 1991, I said, Mr. Secretary, you must be pretty happy with the performance of the troops in, in Desert Storm. And he said, uh, well, yeah, he said, but, but not really, he said, because the truth is we should have gotten rid of Saddam Hussein, and we didn't. And this was just after the Shia uprising in, in March of 91, which we had provoked, and then we kept our troops on the sidelines and didn't intervene. And he said, but one thing we did learn, he said, we learned that we can use our military in the region, in the Middle East, and the Soviets won't stop us. He said, and we've got about five or ten years to clean up those old Soviet client regimes, Syria, Iran, Iraq, before the next great superpower comes on to challenge us. And it was like, you know, I'm coming out of the Mojave Desert. I've been training troops. I haven't been thinking geostrategy for some time. And suddenly, a guy just sort of shoves this nugget at you. Well, you remember it. It was a pretty stunning thing. You mean... The purpose of the military is to, to, to start wars and change governments. It's not to sort of deter conflict. We're going to invade countries. And, I, I, you know, my mind was spinning. And uh, I put that aside. It was like a nugget that you hold on to. This country was taken over by a group of people with a policy coup. Wolfowitz and Cheney and Rumsfeld and... You could name a half dozen other collaborators from the Project for a New American Century. They wanted us to destabilize the Middle East, turn it upside down, make it under our control. It went back to those comments in 1991. Now, did anybody ever tell you that? Was there a national dialogue on this? Did senators and congressmen stand up and denounce this plan? Was there a full-fledged American debate on it? Absolutely not. And there still isn't. And that's why we're failing in Iraq. Because Iran and Syria know about the plan. All you have to do is read the, the, the weekly standard and, and listen to Bill Crystal, And he blabbermouths it all over the world. Richard Pearl the same way. They could hardly wait to finish Iraq so they could move into Syria. It was like a laydown. Oh, our legions are going to go in there. This wasn't what the American people voted George Bush into office. Well, they didn't actually vote him into office, but it wasn't what many of the people who. It wasn't what he campaigned on. He campaigned on a humble foreign policy, the most arrogant foreign policy in American history. He campaigned on no peacekeeping. No nation building, and here he is with Afghanistan and Iraq. It's astonishing. So the root of the problem 
is not how many troops are in Iraq. Please believe me. Don't be mad if you're a Democrat at your Democratic congressman because they can't reduce the troops and frustrate the president. That's not the issue. And if you're a Republican, don't be mad at the Democrats because they're fussing with the troops. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you're an American, you ought to be concerned about the strategy of the United States in this region. What is our aim? What is our purpose? Why are we there? Why are Americans dying in this region? That is the issue. Okay, so Clark is talking about a policy coup. Now, what is that? That means that a cabal of warmongers took over not the social organization of this country, but the military planning The United States spends more on military than the rest of the world combined. 50% of our, your uh, discretionary budget for the country is spent on military. While our bridges are collapsing, our water systems are collapsing, we've got people on bottled water because they're their state is too cheap to uh, fix the, uh, the poisonous uh, pipes. I remember Bernie Sanders uh, saying in, I think it was in Burlington, he was talking to the mayor up there and uh, the pipe, had, uh, a water main had burst. And uh, the mayor was saying, uh, these pipes are, uh, were here, are here from before the war. And Bernie looked at him and he said, which war? And he said, the Civil War. So we got plenty of money for war, but we don't have any money for the country. Now, what, what troubles me is that the people give them a pass. They let this go by. Why? Why? We are, the, we are the sovereign of this democratic republic by definition. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, you know, we establish this constitution. The constitution is the, is the supreme law of the land. We the people have the power. Now, in theory, we are able to elect whomever we please to do whatever we want them to do, presuming that they will do what they said they were going to do. But in fact, that's not true. We do not have an election system that is, is responsive to the people. And there's abundant documentation. Now, Greg Pallast, whom you know I admire, has uh, made much since 2000. He started talking about this in 2000, and I've got his book, you know, I bought it then. And I got his little deck of cards. There's Bush's face on there. The Joker is wild, you know. But uh, the 2000 election was jimmied, stolen. Catherine Harris was the uh, Secretary of State of Florida. And she used a uh, piece of software. If I can think of the name of it. Choice something. What it did was it it looked on it looked through all the Democratic voters in Florida 
and found ones that also voted in Texas. At least there was a guy in Texas with the same name, although not necessarily the same age or the same middle name. But that doesn't matter. First and last, if it matches, we take them off the roll because they're trying to vote in two different states at once. Crowd. No, crowd strike. That's something else. That's this modern cookery. Anyway, they did the same thing in, in 2004 against John Kerry in Ohio, but the Secretary of State was uh, Ken Blackwell. And there's all kinds of, of dirty electioneering or, or, or election processing. They uh, removed voting machines from the poor, mostly black, which is Democrat, neighborhoods, and had plenty. There was no lines in the, in the Republican neighborhoods. It was just in the poor Democratic neighborhoods. You had five hours in a line to vote. You know, a lot of people can't do that. Even if, they, even if they're willing, they can't do it. They don't have time. They've got to work. So all kinds of dirty pool, and that's that's what Greg Palace talks about. But he does not. I've heard him mention in in like two or three words. Yes, there was uh, corruption in the uh, in the uh, Democratic primary, but he doesn't spend any time on it. But in my view, that was the worst thing that happened in 2016. Because Bernie Sanders won the Democratic nomination. He didn't almost win. He won. At least if you add in the people like in his hometown of Brooklyn, New York. 120, 130, 150,000 people in Brooklyn, Democrats that have voted in Brooklyn for decades a lot of them, went to vote, and lo and behold, they're not registered as a Democrat. There's good evidence to suggest that when um, Josh Uretsky, who was who the, the Democratic National Committee, said to the Sanders campaign, Here, here's, a, here's a great uh, uh, guy that you could uh, make good use of as your... Uh, um, campaign um, database manager because he, he knows a lot about the, uh, the the NGP van van being the voter access network which we all used when we were canvassing you know the van we print out we print out these turfs they give us maps with all these little dots, you know, where the houses were that we wanted to knock on the doors. This here is Durham, New Hampshire, where I spent many weekends driving down from Portland. That was great fun, you know, I enjoyed it. But when the, uh, the van crashed a number of times and the Democrat and, and the Bernie people would point it out to the DNC they would say hey this isn't supposed to happen because we can see into your data and what they should have been saying is presumably you can see into ours too and that's what happened so this Josh Uretsky was fired after he was accused by the Clinton people of stealing their voter information. But I dare say what happened was during those times, and there were many, when the database uh, wall, the firewall between the two databases was, was dropped, and you could just go in and there and cherry pick and get all these names, and then when you wanted to uh, go to the voting registration bureau, and you could just, if you had the inside line, you could just take them off. And all of a sudden, there's, the Bernie voters were not registered to vote in a primary. 
And so he was robbed. And, and he might even have won anyway, except for the uh, infernal superdelegates. Now, what is that? What's a superdelegate? Well, um, like I suggested to, to my friend Lori Dobson when she was down on the floor of the convention, she says, what can I say to these people? And I said, well, you know, I was on the phone. I was up in the, in the stands there. And I said, the, uh, the Burmese military has um, reserved 25% of the votes for themselves, presumably to protect Burma against Aung San Suu Kyi. You know, protect them against freedom, protect them against democracy. You know, too much democracy is a, is a not unheard of phrase. If you've ever heard of the Powell memo, Lewis Powell, a tobacco lawyer from South Carolina that uh, was asked to write a memorandum to his friend across the street, lived across the street from him, who was the head of the Chamber of Commerce about how all of us hippies back in the 60s were going to overthrow capitalism and they needed to be needed to be stopped. And the Powell memo calls for uh, calls uh, Ralph Nader, the most dangerous man in America. And um, calls for all these billionaires to, to fund these think tanks to figure out ways to to solve the problem of too much democracy. Now, we are still the majority. We, the people, are legally the sovereign of this country. But that has been eroded because we don't stand up for it. We don't stand up for our own freedom, and we don't stand up for the freedom of people around the world who are being robbed by these neocons that Wesley Clark talked about who have taken the U.S. military and the U.S. intelligence. They did that at the beginning, right at the beginning. The Dulles brothers took over the foreign policy of the country. And they were neocons before neocons. Neocons sprang out of the, uh, the uh, staff of uh, war Democrat Senator... Um, Scoop Jackson in, in Washington State. They had been like uh, uh, Irving Crystal, the father of Bill Crystal, was the was the founder essentially of the neocons. His doctrine stems from uh, philosopher uh, University of Chicago philosopher Leo Strauss, who uh, delineated three types of people in the world: the philosophers who promulgate religion and war, but don't participate in either one. The second class is the gentlemen, who are very patriotic, at least they think that's what it is, that's what they call it, and they go to fight all these wars, and they are deep into these religions. And then the rest of us are called the vulgar many, who are to be either eliminated or you know, pushed to the side. But uh, the Dulles brothers, there's a, there's a great story. Uh, 1917, Foster Dulles was a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell, which is still today the biggest Wall Street law firm. Now, this is not a Wall Street law firm that you go to to get a contract written or uh, to represent you in court. They are a company that you go to if you are one of their clients to complain about a third world country who is not doing what you want them to do. And they will, oh, well, we'll take care of that right away. And in this case, this was 1917. 
and he was uh, Foster was already a, a partner in Sullivan Cromwell, and by that time I think Allen was all was also a lawyer there. And um, Foster Dulles uh, was informed of a an election in Cuba, which was lost by the uh, U.S. friendly conservative government. And uh, the president refused to cede power. And the liberals who won the election were in the streets making a, a great deal of commotion. The uh, Supreme Court of Cuba, this is 1917, you know, we had just taken it over from the Spanish, uh, you know, uh, 20 years earlier. And our uh, envoy down there, a fellow named Gonzalez, sent a cable to uh, the Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, saying this is a very dangerous situation. The, uh, the, the president has threatened violence. The president, they refused to, to leave office, even though he lost the election. And so Foster gets on the train. He's up in New York. He gets on the train and goes down the next morning to uh, to um, D.C. and has breakfast with Uncle Bert, Robert Lansing, the Secretary of State. His grandfather was also Secretary of State under Benjamin Harrison in like 1885 when uh, the United States overthrew the Queen of Hawaii and to protect her. Sorry, I got to answer the door. So anyway, this cable that Gonzalez sent from Cuba to Robert Lansing, by the way, I have a copy of that. There's a, there's a whole uh, uh, big folder of those cables at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. I've downloaded it. I don't have a paper, but anyway, um, so he goes to Uncle Bert and he says, you know what I think we ought to do? We ought to send two fast destroyers down there, one to each coast, the southern and the northern, in the area where the uh, leftists are. And they did that immediately, the same day. And they sent, I don't know if it was 5,000 Marines or something, that stayed for five years. Well, maybe it was some number of Marines that stayed for five years. And the leftists threw up their hands and said, I guess we're beaten. And so uh, the story I, I, is, is called the sugar intervention. You can look that up on Wikipedia, the sugar intervention. Because all these clients of, of uh, Sullivan Cromwell, were most of them were sugar planters and also mining and railroads. <coughs> and they wanted a, they wanted a business-friendly government down there that wasn't going to whine about environment or workers' rights, you know. They wanted to be able to tighten the screws till blood comes out and then back it off a quarter turn and call it good. You may remember that the next president we had after after that time, which was, was Wilson then, the next one was... Uh, uh, Warren Gamaliel Harding, and his vice president was uh, Cal Coolidge, who took office when Harding died. And Coolidge, they, they called him Silent Cal. My mother, who was already in her dotage by that time, she was 93 or something. I mentioned, I was telling this story to her, and she says, Silent Cal. She rem that came right out of her, her childhood memory. She was born in 1912. So there was, there was talk about Silent Cal, but he said, the business of America is business. That's what the business people believe, and that's what they intend for it to be the case, and they've got a lot of power. But we've got the numbers. And, but if we don't use them, if we let them divide us, I mean to tell you, the people that voted for Trump 
might uh, believe that, that business friendly is a good thing. But if you get to know them, you'll find that they are not too happy with corporate rule any more than we on the left are. And we're cutting our, our own throats if we do not make an effort to come to a common purpose with them wherever we can. And you've got, you've got libertarians who I disagree with about economics, but I sure like their foreign policy. Ron Paul wants to pull every American troop back home where they belong, defending this country, not robbing the world. If we don't, we ought to change the name of the Defense Department to the Department of Armed Robbery, because that's what it is. That's what it is, the Department of Armed Robbery. I'm not going to go into that, and someday maybe I, maybe I will talk about Smedley Butler. But um, happy 4th of July. While we're all over the world taking away people's independence and trying to destroy one of the few countries that is actually standing up for its own independence, that's Russia. But Russia's been a target of the Anglo-American empire since 1820 at the latest. Uh, Kipling wrote a, a delightful little book in uh, 1900. He serialized it in Maclean's uh, magazine called Kim, story of a, uh, a half-breed Indian child, a son of, a, of an Irish uh, sergeant in the British Army, Kimball O'Hara, and a, a native woman. And in the story, he was taken under the wing of British intelligence in the person of one Mabu Bali, who taught him spycraft. And the whole thing was the great game the great game, remember that, between uh, Victoria and Tsar for control of the Hindu Kush, control of Central Asia. And that's still the game today. And you know, um, a fellow named uh, uh, Sir Halford John McKinder who was the uh, director of the uh, London School of Economics, 1904, he read a, a, a paper called uh, The Geographical Pivot of History to the Royal Geographical Society in London, which he talks about the heartland, which by which he means the area around Ukraine. And later he described, he summarized the, 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 sen the sense of that by saying, now you can look this up under geographical pivot of history, it's in Wikipedia, or you can find it by Halford McKinder, M-A-C-K-I-N-D-E-R, one word. Uh, whoever controls Eastern Europe uh, uh, rules the heartland and whoever controls the heartland rules the world island the world island is that contiguous mass of land from Gibraltar to Kamchatka all the way through Spain Europe and Russia all the way to the Pacific that's the world island the biggest island in the world the biggest continent Eurasia and whoever controls the world island controls the world. Now this was before airplanes, so that's that 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 shades his perspective. But this tremendous land mass he talks about, eleven time zones. You know, Russia has eleven time zones. They're guarded on the north by ice. Although now that we've ruined the climate. That's not so, so much of a problem. We, they can still be attacked there even in the winter. Well, at least in the summer. I don't know. The winter is still frozen. But before long, if things go the way they're going, Manhattan will be underwater. They'll have to, they'll have to move the subways up 
upstate a little bit, get out of the water. But the, they're protected on the south by the highest mountains in the world. They're protected uh, on the west by an ocean, on the, on the east, on the east by an ocean, on the, on the west, uh, vast expanse of land. So it has always been a prized desire. And uh, I translated, uh, I'm about halfway through translating a book uh, by a fellow named um, uh, uh, Emile Fleurin, who was, for a couple of years, he was foreign minister of France in like 1884 to 86 or something like that. He wrote this book in 1906 called uh, La France Conquise, France Conquered. And it's a it's a diatribe against uh, the King of England, who died four years later, uh, Edward VI. And he talks about how Edward was played an important role in the uh, instigation of the Russo-Japanese War by spreading rumors and by the manipulation that he was able as Victoria's son and the uncle of half of the kings of, or rulers of Europe, including Russia, Russia and Germany. His greatest fear was that his two nephews, Willie and Nicky, would combine against him, Germany and Russia. They would come to an agreement and together with Russia's uh, vast uh, resources and uh, agricultural power, and uh, not, not to mention the biggest army in the world at the time. This is under the czars, of course. And Germany's uh, overwhelming industrial preeminence and scientific preeminence, they would be unstoppable. And the vision, as, as Florent says, um, to keep, uh, to uh, ruin the sleep of his predecessors, the kings of England, uh, to make him afraid that uh, Russia was going to threaten India, the crown jewel of, of uh, Victoria's imperial crown, still a great uh, source of income. <clears throat> I don't know if you knew it, but uh, have you ever heard of the Opium Wars? In... Um, in the early part of the 1800s, and actually starting before that, Britain and America were both engaged in selling opium to China. They they went greatly out of their way to uh, hook the Chinese on opium. The Opium Wars, 1835, 1838, and then again the second Opium War was like 1858, something like that, within a year or two of that. And in the, at the beginning. They were, they were, the, the Americans and the, the British were buying so much tea from China. And the Chinese didn't want wool or, you know, little uh, handmade wooden objects. They wanted silver. Because silver was the basis of the, of the British uh, uh, monetary system. And it was de being depleted at a rapid rate. And so they thought, well, I got an idea. We, we can grow opium in Bengal, which is under our control, and Afghanistan, which is under our control, highland and lowland opium, and we can sell it to the Chinese and get our silver back. So they started doing that, and the emperor was furious. And they the Chinese uh, uh, authorities seized a, a shipment of opium and put the, uh, the captain and the crew in jail and... and dumped the opium in a trench and, and ruined it with lime, and then they flushed it out to sea with water. And uh, London sent four man of war and 5,000 Royal Marines and devastated the coast of China with their big guns. And the emperor said, okay, 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 okay. okay. You can sell your opium here. You can have the concession. They said, okay, well, we also want Hong Kong for 100 years. 
Okay, okay, okay. So, you know, it's it's robbery. It's highway robbery. It's not, uh, it's not um, business. It's, cr it's a crime. And the people in power are criminals. And this is not new. The, uh, the Athenians, you know, uh, in uh, the Peloponnesian War, they came to uh, the island of Delos and the uh, Delian Commission met with them and the Athenian envoys said uh, what they wanted, you know, and uh, the, uh, the Delian uh, uh, Commission said, we, uh, we believe it is our right to refuse, you know, to be slaves. And the Athenians said, well, you know, questions of right and wrong really are only addressed among equals in power. But uh, in all other cases, the, uh, the strong do what they will and the weak suffer what they must. And that's, you know, that's refreshingly honest, isn't it? We don't hear that today. We hear all kinds of mumbo jumbo, but that's what they're saying. Might makes right. Now, but we, the people, have the power but we are we are are hypnotized and we're clumsy and we're you know we're we're given bread and circuses so that we don't realize we're getting robbed along with our foreign fellow victims they're getting bombed and we're just getting robbed you know they're even threatening my social security which I'm 70 I think I have it coming I I paid into it all my life I don't see why anybody should suggest that I don't have a right to that. But they want it. Anyway, independence. We need to be independent. Again, we're not independent now. We're under a tyranny. And it's because we do not take the bull by the horns. Nothing can stop us if we stand together. But do we? I love you all. See you later.